still in kind of individual study mode. I haven't quite decided uh, exactly what we want to go through. Last week we covered the different studies we've done since 2017. And towards the end, we uh, began to, I, I gave you a few things on the timeline. And what I want to do is I want to take tonight and just take our whole study time and go back over um, the timeline itself. Because the timeline is one of the things you, you, it's a method of Bible study. Like, there's certain tools that are good for you to have when you study your Bible. One of the most important things you can have is a concordance, okay? That's not a commentary. A concordance helps you to compare Scripture with Scripture. A concordance gives you cross-references, all right? So if you have like a treasury of Scripture knowledge, sometimes a study Bible will have them, um, like I think my online Bible has some on there. Like I think like on this one, if I would, you see where it's underlined? If I were to, in verse 9, if I double, come on Betsy, hold it. See, it'll define it or it'll give it a cross reference. And, you know, that one is just, it's, you know, something that may relate to that verse there. And some are, some are better than others, but a concordance is very good. Commentaries are good. You have to be careful with commentaries because those are men's opinions. So, uh, but you can learn some historical things there. Sometimes they have cross references. Uh, if you use a King James Bible, a good eight, Webster's 1828 dictionary. I say there's a, there's a website called Webster's 1828 and it's been down. I, I was trying to show some, well, I don't know if it was maybe you guys or somebody else I was trying to show it to and uh, pulled it up and it didn't work. And it hadn't worked ever since. I'm hoping they'll bring that back up. But I think there's an app and there's software you can get. Or you get a big old green Webster's 1828 dictionary. Say, so why the Webster's 1828? Because back then, they used Bible verses to help illustrate and explain uh, definitions. Uh, so back then, they had that. Now, as time has went, they've got away from that. Why? Because they want to sell Webster's 1828. They want to sell the newer Webster dictionaries and... Uh, they just took the Bible verses out of it. But if you go to 1828, one, it'll, it, it's got better definitions for the older words, and it's got the Bible references in there. So a concordance, commentary, uh, Webster's 1828 dictionary. Those are what we call Bible study tools. Now, another thing, real practically, might be something like a notebook. <laughs> when you take notes, or if you have a study Bible that has wide margins, so that you can put notes in it there as well. For myself, one of the best, my most used tool is this right here, the Carter Bible and um, Power Bible. I have two different types of, own, of, of digital Bibles because they do different things. On my computer, it's a very old one. I just like it. I've gotten used to it called Power Bible. And on my iPad and my phone, I use the Carter Bible, and obviously I use it to project it with you guys. So, but I can put notes in this and save it and sync it with other ones if I'm logged into my own thing. So, that gives you all that. But one of the things that I've learned, and I didn't learn this in Bible college, didn't learn this growing up, was the importance of the Bible study tool called a timeline. Now, you guys know what a timeline is, and we'll start with it right here. Um, we'll just make our little arrow, and we have this bigger board now, so this is great. All right, very long. Now, generally, when I draw a timeline if for the Bible, I'm going to try to represent about 7,000 years, all right? So you got to be a little more precise and measure it off a little bit. But generally, we don't, I don't try to make, take a timeline and make one that's permanent. You say, well, Brother Mark, why do you redraw the timeline over and over again? Well, why do you think? that pastor and myself do it that way? Why would we, instead of having one that was set, why would we draw it over and over again? What do you think? Okay, teach different things, have different emphasis. Repetition, keeping it in your memory. Yeah. Yeah. It's generally a method of teaching. All right, so that we can put it up here. And there's so much to put, I can't put everything up here. What I'm going to do tonight is give you some of the basics, but it's important because what it does, especially if you're a visual learner, and 
you know, you could, if you had to put something together and they gave you two sets of instructions and one of them was all words and the other one was um, like diagrams and pictures, well, if that's the case, you may pick one over the other. And sometimes that's just based on how you learn. But the timeline was a very important visual aid for me, but it also put things in perspective and helped me see things more clearly. So what we're going to do is if we want about four, we want to start with the cross. So if we find about the center right here, that's going to be about 3,500 years. So we'll come over to about right here and we will put the cross. I generally, on about all of my timelines, I put the cross and that's um, kind of a basis point there. So we're going to look at about 4,000 years and about 3,000 years right there. So we're probably, and we're already off a little bit, but that's okay. I don't worry too much about that. I just try to get it close. All right. Well, after I draw the cross, what we want to do, these are the places and things that people get confused with. The fact of when Jesus came, when he left, when he's coming again. I like to put on here, We'll put, and this is one that most everybody's going to agree with. We'll bring an arrow down. This area up here is going to represent heaven as far as the timeline going up there. We put a lot of information down here. We'll be writing that stuff in. But this right here and this distance, what do you think this represents? Okay. Or Christ, not, not just his life, be more specific. His birth. Okay. Because we're going to get, if, if, if the cross is right here, we got about three and a half years here, and we got about 30 here. This is when he came to the earth. He died, and very shortly after he died, he ascended and went back up to heaven and has stayed there ever since. So we got those two that we put on. Now, from this point on, one of the things we'll emphasize, and I, I generally... Not everybody understands this part, but when we put the parentheses in, I can remember Pastor Payne doing it for the first time, and I was like, why would you use a parentheses? It's the same reason you use a parentheses in English. If Even in the Bible at times, if there's places where the Bible will use a parentheses, that means if there's a thought that started, you could continue that. If you took the parentheses out, you could continue that thought and kind of pick up right where you left off. It's just something that's inserted. It's something that is inserted in there, all right? But the kind of, the thought goes here and then continues over here. That's why we put it in parentheses, and the timeline works that way. All right, so we've got this time period right here. We'll start putting some numbers on it. So we've been here in this time period about 2,000 years, and we generally put these two over here. We've got the seven years of tribulation, and then the 1,000 years. So obviously we're off. That's 1,000, that's 2,000. So we tried, we failed. I didn't have a tape measure. All right? Now, the fact that the end of the age of grace, right on that line, we draw a line, we put this here, we make some clouds, we draw it coming down here. This is where the Bible says we meet the Lord in the air. This is what we call the rapture. Is the word rapture in your Bible? No. All right? Just so you know that. Good job. The word rapture is not in your Bible. It describes an event that's explained in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now see, as I'm explaining this, I might put what I'll do sometimes, very simply, my drawing skills are limited, but I will put, that looks like a upside down 4, um, looks almost like a chair, but it's a throne. All right? This is what we call the judgment seat of Christ. Because that's what takes place right after the rapture. We go up, we meet the Lord in the air, and that's where the, the judgment seat of Christ takes place. At the end of the seven years of tribulation, Christ will come down, boom, right there, and this is what we call the second coming. Now, there's lots of people that get this. I'll try not to touch it there. The rapture. They get these two events mixed up or they take the two and put it together. All right. So we have the rapture. This is where we go up and the Lord comes here. It says we meet him in the clouds. At the second coming, the Bible says specifically he comes to the earth and he's here. And we can put 
another nice little throne there because that represents him setting up his kingdom upon the earth. And then at the end of the thousand years, there is several events that take place. Depends on what your emphasis is. Who can remember a few of the events that are going to take place at the end of the thousand years? You got the great white throne judgment. I usually will put that great white throne judgment. All right? Because that's a lot of words to write. That's one of the things that's going to take place. So what's going to happen before that? The mark of the beast is over here in the tribulation period. All right? So what else? Gog and Magog. Right. There's a battle of Gog and Magog. Now there's another very important battle that takes place at another time, which is Armageddon. And Armageddon is represented right here at the end when Christ comes back in his, um, to take his throne. When Christ came the first time right here, he came as a manger, as a manger. He came as a babe in the manger there, came very lowly, very humble. When he comes again, he's going to be coming on his white horse as a king, as a leader. And he's going to come and clean house, and he's going to establish his kingdom upon the earth. Satan will be bound a thousand years. What's going to happen over here? What happens to the devil? Oh, yeah, let's back up, though. Before Gog and Magog. No, well, before that. Where is he at all this time? He's where? He's, ba he's bound. He's bound in the center of the earth. He's bound for that thousand years. And then at the end, the Bible says he'll be loose for a season. So, before the great white throne, before Gog and Magog, there is the, we'll call it the loosing of Satan. All right? So he's loose for a season. He goes out, gathers his army. There's the battle of Gog and Magog. God wipes them out. And then you have the great white throne judgment. And then Satan is cast into the lake of fire. So we have hell at the center of the earth and we have the lake of fire which takes place over here. You see, all these different events and all these different things that are going on, it, when you can put it on a timeline and you can see where it fits and you can say, this is here, this is here. Now you get over into this stuff here, it gets easy to get confused. Is he talking about, because like when people say the last days, yep. People nowadays, every time something bad happens, they think Jesus is coming back. Why? They'll say, well, in the last days, all these things are going to happen. If somebody asks me about the last days, what do I say to them? Anybody know? I'll take this group first before I ask that group back there. What is it that I say if somebody says, well, tell me about the last days? What is my response? You're close. You're close, but there's something specific that I say. I want to see if this group remembers. I'm going to ask Hunter next. Hunter, you remember? You ain't got it, Tristan? Which one? Which one? All right. So, y'all never heard that? You, did anybody remember that? You remember it? Yeah. Zach, you remember it? Okay. All right. So, I would say, because, he, and here's why. Watch. At the end, there, the Bible speaks about the last days of the age of grace. Now, Paul believed in the very beginning of it, he was in the last days, because there's nothing in Romans through Philemon that gives us any indication of when this is going to take place. Now, the Bible gives all sorts of details about the events and the timing of what takes place in the seven years. Everything over there in Revelation and all the prophecies they know it's seven years. They know the events that are going to take place. They can see the things that are going on there. So they know about those times. So there's going to be the last days of the tribulation period. Then there's going to be the last days of the kingdom before these events. So if you just say last days and you don't distinguish this one, this one, or this one, it can be confusing. If you talk about Jesus coming back, and you don't discern whether it's the rapture or the second coming, it becomes confusing. One of the main reasons that you use a timeline is for one specific, remember this word. When it comes to your Bible, this is what you want, clarity. You want it to be clear. Most people that attend church, 
have religious beliefs, they're very vague in their beliefs. They don't, it's hard for them to nail things down. They have ideas, they have thoughts, there's generalizations, but when you study your Bible specifically, you're looking for clarity. Part of rightly dividing your Bible, is, you know what we're doing when we rightly divide our Bible? We're dividing the rapture and the second coming. That's pretty simple. We're dividing that the tribulation period and the kingdom and the age of grace are all different time periods. They all are, they have different instructions, different programs there. Can we take the mark of the beast today? No. It's impossible. It cannot be done. None of the teachings about the mark of the beast apply to us today, but still all scripture is profitable, and it's good for us to learn about it and be able to understand it. Right here, you better know something about the mark of the beast in the seven years of tribulation. When Christ returns back, ain't going to be any mark of the beast. Why? He's going to be in hell in the bottomless pit, bound for that thousand years there. All right? So part of what the, the timeline does for us is that it gives us clarity into this. So we can begin, we can do things like putting, we did this a little bit last week, Romans through Philemon. Um, we can go uh, Hebrews through Revelation in that area uh, over in here, and it continues over there. We've got uh, Matthew through um, Acts. Now, I'm going to put one, one thing on the timeline right here that it might be a little hard for you to understand, but it's very, very important. All right? We're going to come back over here. Now, in the first 11 chapters of your Bible, how much time goes by approximately? Anybody know? 2,000 years. So, if we come over here and we make a mark right here, and we say, okay, here we have Genesis 1, 2. All right? Now, we put an arrow on the end of our timeline and on the end of that over there because God always has been and God always will be. There's no beginning or ending there. So those arrows have a representation. Genesis 1, 2, we see that is that beginning of the recreation of the earth. We've done a timeline before to show that there's several events that take place way over here. If we're going to draw a timeline and show that stuff, we kind of shifted it over and we talked about the creation of Lucifer, we talked uh, the archangel, we talked about the creation of all the angels, the creation of the earth according to Job chapter uh, 38 there, the fall of the angels, the rebellion, the creation of hell as it talks about, and then the destruction of the earth there. That's why you have the earth without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. It's a giant mud ball. When you look over in Job 38, where the earth is actually created and it uses, you know, if you look at it, I'll just show it to you right quick. And we've covered some of this before, but um, where's Job at? It's on here somewhere. There it is. Job, and I'm pretty sure it's 38. Is that right? Yep. God is responding to him um, in the midst of all that he was going through, and he's kind of putting it on him right here. And he asks him some questions. Verse 4, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When you look at verses 4 through 6, if you have any knowledge of building, uh, masonry, construction, any of that, you begin to look there and say, foundations, okay. In order to build a house, you've got to pour footings. You've got to have a foundation. Um, when you look at measures, you've got to have measurements. You've got to have a tape measure. You've got to have correct measurements in, your, in the architectural diagrams and what they're going to follow. And then with every board that's cut and everything that's put together, um, you've got the measures, stretch the line upon it. Well, every good carpenter is going to have a chalk line. He's going to have something to make sure that he's got things level to make a straight line in there. Um, once again, it mentions foundations. It talks about a cornerstone. If you're building something masonry-wise, you've got to have that cornerstone that you build off and out from. So right there, it's got all these building terms, and verse 7 is very important. 
It says, when the morning stars sang together. And we looked up, you studied out, the morning stars are the angels. It says, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So there was a time back in eternity past that the earth was created and it was before the angels fell because all the sons of God shouted for joy. So that's one of those things where you put all those things on a timeline and then you use some logic. It's like, well, whoa, there was a fall. The Bible says that. Hell was created to try to throw it off there. The earth was destroyed there. But there was a time when Lucifer, according to Ezekiel 14, you know, it talks about what he looked like before he fell. He, you know, his, the way he was presented, he had the tabrets. He was able to produce music from himself. He had all these uh, precious stones as his covering there. This was before he fell into rebellion. So you've got these different events, but when you look at that right there, it's like, well, if all the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, it becomes very interesting to think. It's like, so why were the angels rejoicing at the creation of the earth before any of them fell? And that can take you to other places in the Scripture to realize that there's very likely that they were on the earth before we were. And it allows the earth to be very old, and God to still create it. And then the creationists and the evolutionists don't, you know, it's hard for them to argue with each other. Um, but a lot of people just don't want to look at that part of the Bible because traditionally they've looked at it one way for so long and they don't pay attention to it. And generally a timeline is not used that much. So we've got this. So let's come over and let's go about halfway here. And we'll put Genesis 11 there. Well, who is our main character in Genesis chapter 11? Anybody know that? That's a tough question. Anybody know the main character of Genesis 11? <laughs> That's a tough one. Anybody want to guess? Noah? Nah, he's over here somewhere. All right, after Noah. After Noah. Very important guy. God's going to use him to elevate and establish a nation. Abram. Here... We write it like this, Abram, Abraham, okay? He was Abram. God calls him out, Genesis 11, and gives him the promise that he is going to raise up a nation and that their seed will be as the, the sand of the, uh, of the beaches and the stars of the heavens there. And he elevate, and his, basically God's plan is, is you've had these 2,000 years where man has failed, man has failed. So God's going to take Abram and elevate him and create the Jews, the law, and he will separate them by what? What's so important under the law? What made a Jew a Jew? They had to be what? Circumcised. All right. So they had to be circumcised. So you've got up here, God elevated, changed him from Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, and that that seed line would go out and that the Messiah would come from this seed line. And all that, and we write down here, all the other nations, well, the Gentiles, all the other nations would get to God through God's chosen people, Israel. They had to be circumcised, they had to follow the law, they got the covenants, began with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you get all these spokesmen that go through, all the events, the kings, Israel, Judah, the splitting of them there. But in essence, what you get is Israel just fails over and over and over again. Israel, if you go back and study all the kings, Israel never had a good king. Judah may have had three or four somewhere in that neighborhood, but they just messed it up. The book of Judges. You know what the book of Judges is about? Israel, Israel getting, rebelling, getting in trouble, getting their butt kicked, calling out to God, and then him having to raise up a judge that would deliver them, and then they'd be okay for a while, then they start over. It just goes over and over and over and over again. So you have this line up here represents the nation of Israel, and down here you got these other nations. God specifically elevated them as God's chosen people. The other nations would follow the law and get to God through them. However, what's going to happen right here, Matthew's a transitional book. 
in the book of Matthew, the Messiah shows up, and every scribe and Pharisee knows it because it's been prophesied all through here, the timing of it. They knew the year. They knew the time when the Messiah was going to come. They should have been waiting on him, but because of their rebellion, they rejected him. That's why you had to have John the Baptist to be the forerunner of Christ. It wasn't the nation of Israel as a whole because they're failing. That's why you got John outside of the land God promised to him. He's out there in the Jordan River doing what? Baptizing. And what does he say about Jesus when he shows up? He says, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus had to come to die. The original plan was not for him to die on the cross. You know how he was supposed to die? Over here in Genesis chapter, I think it's you got chapter 11 and um, oh, I can't remember it now. The chapter where Abraham goes up with Isaac up on to the mount and is going to sacrifice him. Right. And God stops it, and Isaac looks at him before that, says, well, hey, we got everything but a sacrifice, Dad. <laughs> God shall provide himself a lamb. And he physically provided a lamb for that sacrifice that day, which showed the temporary sacrifice that they would do all the way up until the Messiah came. See, that's one of the reasons Jesus kept going in and cleansing the temple, because he was going to go into the temple and be the sacrifice. But because of their rebellion, instead of him going in there, they took him and they gave him what was probably the worst death that could be conjured up by the Roman government with the cat of nine tails, the plucking of the beard, everything that he went through, and then the embarrassment of being hung completely unclothed there, beaten to a place where if you didn't know it was him, his face was so marred, his visage was so marred, the book of Isaiah said, that they, he, he was not recognizable. So that's how bad that it was, and they put him there to put him to shame, and he was put to death. After his death, he's resurrected. You have Acts chapter 2, the kingdom's offered. There, Jerusalem, he says, all right, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, will establish the kingdom. And it was a failure. They rejected him. Two other times in the book of Acts, he's rejected. And finally, in Acts chapter 7, they're like, okay, kingdom's over. A few chapters later, God takes one of the worst sinners <laughs> of the Jews named Saul. Saul was responsible. In Acts chapter 7, when Stephen died, what was, it, what was Paul doing? Holding the garments of those that were picking up the biggest rocks they could find to, to kill Stephen with. Stephen there looked up. He saw Christ up here. He saw Christ stand up. The Bible says he stood. You see, when he stands up over here, it's going to get on. That's when he's going to come back. Remember? Remember, if you remember this, we put a little thing right here at the three and a half year point because anybody remember what one of the things, that, what, what are they going to see at the three and a half year point of the tribulation period? His appearing. There's an appearing where it says they're all going to go and hide under the rock. They're going to wish that the mountains and the rocks would fall on them. There will be such intimidation by what they see right here. When Christ shows himself, the same time that the Antichrist is going to go into the temple and proclaim himself to be God. The same time up in the heavenly places in the book of Revelation where there's going to be that war up there and all those demonic angels up there, all those rebellious angels from way back over here, they're going to get kicked out of heaven with the devil himself. He'll no longer be the prince of the power of the air, and he'll be sent to the earth. And they'll have no more dominion up there. And then the last three and a half years, the great tribulation will take place during that time. And then at the end, Christ comes, deals with everything, sets up his kingdom there. So right here, they're still right here. Christ goes up, kingdom still being offered. You get to about, you get right over there to about Acts chapter 7. And something begins to happen. Now this is important the way, <laughs> this is important the way it goes there. All right, you see there's a slant. 
and you see that it crosses the parentheses. Okay? We talk about transitional books. Matthew's a transitional book bringing in the Messiah. Acts is a transitional book going from them being in the kingdom age to the age of grace. And then Hebrews is a transitional book going from the age of grace back into the 70th week of Daniel or the seven years of tribulation there. But this is important. What begins to happen is the nation of Israel begins to descend and come down to the same level as everybody else. That's why a Jew gets saved the same way we do today. They don't get saved because they're a Jew. They get saved by grace through faith. Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 all deal with Paul talking to the Jews, trying to explain this to them, that, hey, it, it, it ain't about us anymore. Jew and Gentile alike. You go to Acts, I mean, Ephesians chapter 2, and it talks about the middle wall of partition being torn down. That wall that's in between here, that separation between the two is done away with. And now, they're not, it's not about being under the law. It's about being saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. Before this, it was about works. See, remember we've drawn this before for you. We draw the earth, it's two-dimensional, and we say, okay, down here in the very center of the earth is hell itself because it talks about it being a bottomless pit. If the earth rotates, if there's a rotation and there's a circle there, then there's never truly a bottom that is there. So that's a little bit of speculation, but it lines up with Scripture and it makes sense. But in Luke chapter 17, we were studying our soul winning stuff. Remember, we talked about, and the rich man died and was buried, and in hell... He lift up his eyes, being in torments, and saw what? He saw Abraham afar off. In Abraham's bosom, somewhere outside of hell, they were able to see, if we just draw a little circle around it, we don't know if it goes all the way around it, I don't know, but somewhere from in here they were able to see out and see that place called Abraham's bosom. That was the place that all these people that died, that followed the law, they didn't go to heaven, Christ hadn't died. They went to Abraham's bosom, and they were there. You know what they're doing? They're in the center of the earth waiting for the Messiah to come to set up his kingdom so that they would come out. See, one of the things that's going to happen right here, everybody that dies during the tribulation period, the Bible talks about them being up under the altar. Those that are martyred, beheaded, they're going to be up there, and they're going to look at Christ, and they're going to say, Lord, how long? How long before you come back? How long before you avenge us? You got those on the earth who will endure to the end and make it through. And then you're going to have those that are going to come out of his, Abraham's bosom. Those that have, that have the covenants and the promises. They followed the law. They got to go here and they're waiting. They're going to come out right here and they're going to get what God promised them. They're going to get the earth. They're going to get Emmanuel, which is God with us. They are going to get to be upon the earth and rule and reign with Christ in that kingdom. You remember back in the Old Testament when Israel wanted a king? Now, you may not be familiar with this, but they wanted a king. And God, you know what God said? I'll be your king. They said, no, we don't want you, God. We want a king like all the ites, the Hittites and the Moabites and all them ites. You know, they, they, they had a king and they had soldiers. They'd go fight wars. They said, we want a king like them. We don't really want you, God. We want a king. Yeah, they, that's pretty much, they want a king like our enemies, that's true. So they, so, so, some people are just so stupid. They, they're like, no God, we want another king. So he's like, okay, finally, I'll give you a king. Give you Saul. Saul, head and shoulders above everybody else. And what did Saul do? Over and over, he failed. He failed. He failed. But see, God originally wanted to be their king. You know what he's going to do? He's going to be their king. It's, he, he, there's some things, God's very patient. <laughs> he, when he wants something to happen, it's going to happen. He says, I'm going to be your king. You just wait. I'm going to be your king. And he will be right there. So you got those folks that are going in. But see, now, in the age of grace, we're not promised the earth. The Bible says we have spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When we die, we go to heaven. When those folks died, they went to Abraham's bosom so they could get what God promised them, which was the earth. And there's going to come a day when there's a new heaven and a new earth way over here somewhere when all these programs are done. And God has his throne upon the earth and it's the center of everything. And throughout all of eternity, there's going to be all those angelic kingdoms and all, those, all the creation that God's going to do and we're going to rule and reign with him in that there. See, you start putting all this stuff on the timeline. And you start putting, okay, we got up to Genesis chapter 11. Obviously, we go from Genesis chapter 11 all the way over here to, to Malachi. And there's about a 400-year period in between Matthew and Malachi there. But you see, I haven't put everything on the timeline that you could put. All right? There's a lot of other things of events, Bible verses, stuff that's going on. But see, when you begin to see this, what it does is it just gives you some clarity. It helps you to see it. You know, what's the Bible saying in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9? It says, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. You see, we'll finish with this for tonight. The things, this is what pastor's been preaching about for the last five weeks that he was here. He's been talking about the mystery. What people miss, and it just makes the Bible cloudy, is that what God gave in Romans through Philemon he called it a mystery, a mystery hid in God before the foundation of the world. Here? No, back over here somewhere in Job 38. Nobody knew about it. And when that kingdom was rejected, he already had a plan. He says, I'm going to raise up my body. You see, before this time, nobody had ever heard of the rapture. They'd never heard of the body of Christ. They'd never heard of the mystery. Several things that were revealed during this time. How about e eternal, eternal security. You know why some churches struggle and don't teach eternal security? It's because they're looking over here. They don't have eternal security in the tribulation period. They have to endure to the end. If you try to take by grace through faith and combine it with enduring to the end, it's cloudy. It's confusing. There's no clarity. And where there's no clarity, you know what there's not? There's no confidence. There's a lot of Christians that are stubborn, pig-headed, my way or no way, but they don't know why. There's a lot of Baptists that are that way. A lot of all sorts of denominations are that way. There are some people that just says, we just want to get along with everybody. We just don't want to argue. So we just won't teach anything. We don't stand for anything. Or you stand for something that's just not right. Your objective is to be able to take the word of God and have it make sense and study it the way it's given. We understand time. We understand events. We understand differences. There are things that are similar and there are things that are different. There's similarities to the rapture and the second coming, but they ain't the same thing. There are similarities to the great right throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ, but they're very different. When you see the differences and you understand what's written directly to you for you, I mean, some people say, well, I obey the whole Bible. Well, good. Why don't you go march around Jericho? Why don't you go park the Red Sea? Why don't you go raise somebody from the dead? You know why we don't teach that you can speak in tongues here? Because we can't raise anybody from the dead. We can't put anybody's arm back on. Jesus did that stuff. When we have a fellowship, we have to beg people to bring food. What did Jesus do? He said, just give me a little bit. Come here, son. Come here, son. Here we go. Here we go. If I could do that, I'd never have to put out another sign-up sheet again. Ellie wouldn't have to help me cook. I mean, life would be easier. Throwing food everywhere. 5,000 plus the women and children. You better, today, you better put a sign-up sheet out. <laughs> somebody better go to the grocery store uh, or somebody's going to be hungry. 
All right? So you guys came tonight. We didn't pray and ask Jesus. We thanked him for the food. We didn't ask him for it. We went and bought it. Because that's what we do today. You know why they pray? Give us this day, our daily bread. You know why Jesus taught them to pray that way? Because they were going to have to go through the tribulation period, and they wouldn't be able to buy or sell, and God will provide for them daily, whoop, just like he did back over here when he delivered them and took them out of Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land. I could keep going, but I ain't. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for our young people. Lord, I know this is a lot for them to take in, a lot for them to see, but Lord, as, as young people, they need to see this. Lord, I, I pray tonight that they don't even expect in themselves to remember everything that I said and everything that's on there. But Lord, I pray that it begins part of that foundation we're trying to put into our young people, a foundation they can build off of methods and ways that they can go to the Bible and get truth for themselves, to study to show themselves approved unto God. Lord, not just to go through the motions, not to be a puppet, not to be one that's, okay, well, I'm part of this religion, but I don't really know why. I don't know what I believe. I don't know why I believe it. Father, we want to raise up a generation that can take the word of God and handle it correctly. They can be wise in it know what they believe and why they believe it, get their questions answered, have clarity and confidence, yea, so that they can lead a consecrated life for you. Lord, bless our young people in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you, guys.